Welcome to Interviews with the Contrarian. I'm Mark Milkey, Executive Director of the Aristotle Foundation for Public Policy. The Aristotle Foundation is a new think tank in Canada. We hope to launch uh, early in 2023. We will deal with issues related to reason, democracy, and civilization. There's a lot under there, uh, but as we launch, we will roll out some of the studies and fact sheets and videos and ideas that come under those, those three headings, reason, democracy, and civilization. We're in the process of, uh, we've applied for a charitable number and are uh, waiting that with some hope from the Canada Revenue Agency, uh, but all of that is to come. Uh, before we publicly launch though, or, or launch in any significant way, we are doing a few uh, things like these interviews with a contrarian series to give people a sense of what we'll do when we launch. So uh, the interviews with a contrarian series, uh, this is episode number five. And the goal of these is to have uh, thoughtful discussions with authors of books, uh, preferably published in Canada, and give them some uh, publicity and allow viewers to just explore these ideas in these books. So today I wanna to introduce Peter McKinnon, Dr. Peter McKinnon, author of Canada in Question, Exploring Our Citizenship in the 21st Century. And it was recently published by the University of Toronto Press. And um, Peter McKinnon was the president, is president emeritus of the University of Saskatchewan. And he was recently the interim director of the Public Policy School at the University of Calgary. So welcome, Peter, and congratulations on the book, Canada in Question. Thank you very much, Mark. So let's start with the obvious question. Why did you write Canada in Question? Why did you write the book, Peter? Well, I think um, it's, it's a great question. Um, I have growing concerns, and they've been growing for some time. Uh, about the future of Canada. The concerns were captured in part, by the way, Mark, in um, a story. This is the Halifax Chronicle Herald, July the 1st, 2020, Canada Day. Mm -hmm. A significant urban newspaper across the top of page one with the Canadian flag on it the Chronicle Herald apologized for the Canadian flag and the country over which it flies. Um, at the time, it was the latest in a long line of apologies, goodness knows, we've heard a number of those. But this one was more surprising than most, I thought, because it came on a day when most Canadians, including and in particular newer Canadians, uh, express their appreciation and good fortune to live in this country. Um, now that's just symbolic, but I think there are growing concerns. I call them centrifugal forces that are acting upon our citizenship that undermine our sense of what it means to be Canadian. I consider several of these in the book, <clears throat> identity politics, the rise of populism as a style. I'm not talking here so much about the substance because there's good substance as well as perhaps questionable substance, but it's a style and a highly antagonistic one. I think as well, and a Canadian at Harvard has written about the decline of enlightenment values, the turning away from reason and reason as the way of addressing issues and solving problems. Um, so I was concerned about that. I've been concerned too, by the way, about a new generation of indigenous scholarship um, in which liberalism, the rule of law and the market economy are in the sights of these scholars. Uh, for example, one of them, a professor at the University of British Columbia, calls for radical transformation in Canada. Mm. And to quote him, in order to decolonize, we need to sink the ship. So these factors and others, uh, a University of Moncton professor has written a book on the East-West Divide, the Ottawa River, 
and the different challenges to the country east of the Ottawa River from those west of the Ottawa River. He calls the book, by the way, A Tale of Two Countries. Um, I think, too, um, that there is growing estrangement, and we know this, between two provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan and Ottawa, entirely apart from the historical ones with, uh, with Quebec's um, kind of contingent commitments to the country. Here we have two major provinces increasingly estranged from Ottawa. Um, further, at the risk of going on too long, our national institutions in 2021, Pierre, uh, not Pierre Trudeau, but Justin Trudeau, condemned the parliament he leads, the parliament he leads, by the way, as founded on colonialism, discrimination, systemic racism. No word on his part about the centuries upon centuries of the Westminster tradition in the evolution of democracy. No, he said our institutions were founded upon colonialism, and systemic racism. So let me he follow up on that. Sorry, really, go ahead. Yeah. That Canada does not have a core identity. Mm -hmm. So this is the country's prime minister. The country's prime minister. Um, add to that a lack of trust and confidence, which has been documented many times. And that would be, I would say, Mark, at the risk, I'm sure, that I've already taken of going on too long. Those are the reasons why I wrote the book. Uh, feel free to go on. Uh, that's no, that's that's uh, why we have an hour here. So that's that's terrific, Peter. Um, let me explore though, the, and, and tie in what what uh, the prime minister said with your first comment about Halifax, because I think they're part of the same problem. Do you think this is part of a utopian approach to history? And what I mean by that is my sense or my my thoughts on this, or that in the twentieth century, the utopian movement was economic, um, i.e., the Marxists who thought they could create a utopia in the future. Right now, they were wrong. Um, you know, horribly wrong, uh, and did a lot of damage to countries and people around the world uh, with their ideology and their 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 vision of the future. But at least the Marxists, you could argue, were utopian about the future. In theory, they could create the future if they were right, um, but they weren't. But now we have people who look back in history and for some reason expect history to have been perfect, i.e. they're utopian about the past, and they, they compare history to what, uh, like 1867 or 1920, to some standard of perfection as opposed to other countries. So to be uh, clear about it, they compare 1867 or 1920, not to say China where foot binding of women occurred um, or other countries or Russia in 1917 where a revolution was happening. Instead, they look at Canada and compare it to some perfect standard in their own mind or to 2022, which seems um, entirely fanciful. Um, as if you would have expected uh, Johnny McDonald to drive a Prius as well. So is there a problem that we have, we're dealing with people who have no sense of um, historical progress uh, and, and they don't compare Canada to other nation states of, of, uh, of the era, whether it's 1867 or 1920 or 1950, but they're utopian about the past for some bizarre reason, they really expect um, the past should have been perfect. And they're immodest about today as if we've arrived at the pinnacle of perfection, or at least the critics have in their own mind. Is that part of the problem, this utopian nirvana perspective on history? Well, I think that's a great question and I'm not sure that I can give a very comprehensive answer to it. But uh, we know, for example, we know that Canadians are not familiar with their history. We know that it has passed from being a required subject in times past mm. to being at best a kind of a social studies option or part of an option going forward. We know that. We also know that uh, younger people are both more adept on social media and they are more dependent upon it and reliant upon it for sources of news, sources of information and disinformation. Mm. And they link up with other like-minded souls on social media to a kind of uh, push a vision, I suppose, which is, which is in their minds. 
but which may not be uh, more widely shared. Uh, so, yeah, I think lack of understanding of the history, uh, the utopian uh, influence that you mentioned, and uh, the the uh, social media factor, I think, are all at work here, Mark. Um, okay, well, let's um, let's get into the guts of the book then. At the beginning of the book, you 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 start with Athens and uh, their notion of citizenship in ancient Athens. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? How the ancient Athenians? And this is particularly relevant since we're, you know, this is the Aristotle Foundation for Public Policy, and there's an obvious connection to ancient Athens and Aristotle. Um, their conception of citizenship. Can you tell viewers a little bit about that who may be unaware what their conception of citizenship was? How did they see themselves? Well, I think uh, the reason why I started with a reference to it, obviously, uh, this is 2,500 years ago, uh, and uh, the differences between an ancient city-state and a modern democracy occupying half a continent, those differences are manifest. But I was intrigued by the idea expressed by Pericles at the funeral for the soldiers who had fallen early in the Peloponnesian War. He talked about Athens and about why they were fighting for Athens. And he made reference to the fact that engagement, engagement in the public life of Athens is definitional mm. to citizenship. Now, were there people excluded from citizenship? Yes, there were slaves, others, and its citizenship was far from perfect. But its citizenship was what it was in their time. And Pericles, who was in addition to the orator on the occasion, also the leader of Athens, Pericles said that uh, engagement in the public life of Athens is an essential component of citizenship. And those who do not so engage don't belong in Athens. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a pretty clear statement about responsibility uh, and also about uh, consequences. Um, there's a statement attributed to Edmund Burke on that point. It may be wrongly attributed, but it's been attributed to Edmund Burke that evil triumphs when good men do nothing. So that's part of the conception of Greek citizenship, I assume, that there, there's a need to be involved uh, in the affairs of state, of the city-state in their case. Is, is that kind of the conception that we're after, that uh, somebody better take responsibility, otherwise you leave it up to perhaps the tyrants eventually, those who are power seekers? Very much so. And again, it's a small, it's a small geographically small um, community without the other means of engagement and discussion and conversation, uh, at least in any formal sense. You had to have these people getting together and you had to have them talking about what uh, Athens required and what contributions they could make to it. Um, is it possible to be too involved in politics, and what I what I mean by that, or too involved, uh, you know, that that politics can be too involved in civil society, and what I mean by that is, uh, I thought for some time that part of the the angst, or or part of the um, uh, part of the reason there, there's such vitriolic debate these days, and such partisanship, and not normal partisanship, which which you need actually, you need competing factions, um, as the American founders understood to balance things out. Um, but but why it's become so shrill, uh, perhaps, is in part not not just because of social media. I think that's a big part of it. But is it also possible that uh, the governments, the state, have become too involved in people's lives uh, in a way that a century ago would have been unrecognizable? So I'm thinking, for example, of a clear example of um, in British Columbia. I think it was about two years ago now. There was a dispute between a husband and wife on a gender transition for their, I think it was 15 year old daughter. The father said, perhaps wait, sweetheart. Uh, the mother was okay with it. This ended up in court. The father was told not to talk to his daughter about uh, possible transitioning. Uh, again, we're talking about a 15 year old uh, and they're still developing, you know, mentally and psychologically. So, but it occurred to me, uh, 
Obviously, the state has to step in in cases of abuse of, of children. But in this case, a judge stepped in and ordered the father not to talk to his daughter. And in fact, he was locked up for doing so about this issue. Now, that's an extreme example. But to me, uh, it does seem like politics is involved everywhere. I mean, you see this economically over the last century. Uh, but you even see it socially now. So is that part of the problem? And perhaps part of, because you touch on this in the book, the lack of respect for institutions where people think, uh, look, everything I do is touched on by the state and uh, there's a bit of a pushback. Is that, is it possible to be too involved in politics as opposed to what the Greeks wanted was, you know, some responsible, some responsible involvement, uh, but, but limited. We know that uh, certainly our current government believes strongly uh, in the role, and I would say the evidence suggests an increasing role for the government of Ottawa to address all kinds of issues that historically, I think leaders would have been reluctant to comment upon or insert themselves into, whether it's, by the way, matters of the um, social uh, behavior and decorum. Um, we find federal leaders uh, making pronouncements of one kind or another on all manner and kinds of issues. Once that begins, it has, a, I think, a bit of a cascading effect because when issues arise, very quickly the microphone is put in front of their faces and um, pronouncements are made or apologies are rendered or whatever. So yeah, I think, I think the idea um, of government doing more in an unexamined way than perhaps it should is, is an important part of our conversation today. What should we expect from government and what should we not expect from government? We don't have too much learned conversation, at least generally in the population on the latter. Let me follow up on something early in the book as well. You, you approach the question of diversity versus integration, and I find this a fascinating question uh, because to me, every nation state needs something to unite around, some narrative, um, some purpose, some agreed upon set of principles. So for the Americans, it's uh, 1776 and their response to the British and you know life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, Canada, uh, peace, order, and good government. But the question of diversity versus integration, you mentioned that diversity has now become an article of faith. What do you mean by that? Can you expand on that? Well, look, uh, all modern particularly large states have uh, a diverse population. And not only that, they would concede, I think most people would concede that the diversity of the population contributes to its cosmopolitan um, character and activities. So this is not a criticism of diversity. Um, rather, it is a suggestion that diversity is not enough, that in fact, there has to be uh, an overarching set of values, if you like, or interests or beliefs that bind us together as citizens. Are we citizens of a country mm. or are we not? And I wanted to kind of push that question because the appeal for integration, it doesn't just come from me, it comes from an American scholar, Elizabeth Anderson at the University of Michigan, which wrote a great book on integration. Citizenship implies a degree of integration in a country. And uh, if we don't have that, or if we don't, talk about it, or if we don't celebrate it, then the risk is that it will recede and we find ourselves um, without the ties of citizenship. 
I'm not saying that's happening or it has happened to a great degree in this country, but I would say that it's a question worth asking. Are we emphasizing our differences? Remember, if differences are all that we have in common, we may end up in different places. And uh, that's not uh, a prospect that we should readily embrace. So my interest in writing this book is, is on citizenship as an important defining feature of national being and well-being. And I think we need to pay more attention to it. How many times have we heard recently an appeal in the world of public policy that emphasizes citizenship. I don't think, by the way, that it is a rallying cry or even an appeal that we hear very much of anymore. We hear about it in Quebec. We hear about it from time to time in some of the secessionist circles elsewhere in the country. Uh, but the appeal is not to a Canadian citizenship. <laughs> It's to a different kind of citizenship. Well, a regional citizenship uh, in the case of Quebec, right? Um, you know, provincial uh, in their case, and also, you know, with some of the Alberta separatist movements, <clears throat> the same appeal. But you're right about Canadian citizenship. It seems to me um, the part of the problem here is, again, again, we're too many people are on the surface on these issues. They don't think deeply about integration versus diversity. So, um, you can say diversity, but what does that mean? I mean, the United States was a very diverse place, a very diverse country in 1860. You had pro-slavery states and anti-slavery states, but that's not the kind of diversity we uh, would like, uh, would want, would approve of. So diversity as a word means nothing. Uh, you have to put some content into it. So it, it appears to me that's part of the problem here. And integration, um, I guess this is a bit of a reaction, is it not to, uh, you know, some people feeling that in, in the past, integration was too narrowly defined white, Anglo-Saxon, colonial, all the cliches that are out there. Uh, and perhaps it was, but on the other hand, without some shared humanity, without some shared agreed upon set of values, it seems to me, uh, you know, the, the engine of the car, so to speak, of Canada can easily blow apart if everybody thinks they can tinker with it and do their own thing. Eventually, you don't have a working engine. I think that's what you're on about when it comes to integration, right? There needs to be an agreed uh, set of principles uh, even as basic as do we settle things peacefully through democratic elections, which increasingly seems to be under attack in some countries around the world. Um, there's a faction in the Republican Party in the United States, as sympathetic as I am historically to their Republican positions on free trade, for example, uh, the Ronald Reagan shining city on a hill, the leadership during the Cold War of the Americans. I do find um, there are plenty of people now that question the legitimacy of elections. Um, and get into conspiratorial thinking uh, to do so. So again, this is part of the problem, is it not? There's there's a loss of agreement on the basics. Um, I haven't seen as much of that in Canada in terms of elections, but that seems to be the case in some quarters in the United States where they can't even agree that the 2020 election actually was won by Joe Biden. There's a good chunk of the population now that doesn't accept that. How did we get to this place um, in the West in general now, not just Canada, where, where we can't seem to agree in the basics? That is, um, again, a great question for which I don't have anything close to a comprehensive answer. Um, I think it is a process. It's not an occurrence. I think it is a process that is cumulative over years. I think it is a process that is born, as we've already spoken about, to some degree at least from lack of perspective or proportionality. Uh, the question occurs to many of us, I think, um, is Canada fundamentally a positive achievement and is it fundamentally an enviable country and place in which to live? My answer for that question to both questions is yes and yes. But I think we have people now who not only would not answer the questions in the same way, they probably wouldn't even ask the questions in the first place. 
So we have um, factions. We have um, very different perspectives. I think the particularly acute problem now is that we don't talk about them very much. Why is that? Why is that in Canada? I mean, they seem to debate this a little bit more in the United States, from what I can tell in Europe, um, you know, and they have for some time, uh, including issues of immigration, right? Uh, what does that mean for, you know, to be European um, or, or Brit, for example, you know, or, or a Frenchman? Uh, they do seem to, to think about this and talk about this a little bit more openly, which scares some people, but they have the conversation. Um, what is it about Canadians where... Is it just we, we seem to go with trends just seem to take off and they're unquestioned until the moment that they're not? It may be that we're five or 10 years kind of in the trail of America in this respect and that we'll see more of that. We'll hear more of it uh, in the future. But again, um, here, I would point to um, social media as a factor. I have felt it and seen it. Um, to some degree in my own professional life, whereby you have in universities and in and elsewhere, people feeling a very high degree of comfort uh, from closing themselves off from others who hold different views and from associating with uh, individuals with whom they share views, race, color, religion, politics, all of these things. And social media tends to simplify in some ways um, the attitudes uh, perspectives that they have. And in simplifying them, in fossilizing them and closing a lot of the people involved uh, off from contrary opinions, Surely a fundamental feature of democracy is the kind of exchange, that public exchange, uh, that is required to address issues in the public arena. We have too many pronouncements uh, in the public arena and we don't have enough debate. A little bit later, perhaps we should ask what can be done about that. But let me jump into, I mean, you touched on it now, identity politics versus citizenship. Um, it seems to me most successful nation states have united around either some core, common origin, again, like I said, of a, a revolution like 1789 in France, the American Revolution. Um, in, in the Anglosphere, it's generally been the Magna Carta forward, you could say, um, where these rights were gradually developed and appreciated the Edmund Burke approach, which is that we prefer evolution in, in the Anglosphere to revolution. Uh, but we do, there does seem to be this revolutionary temptation. Um, perhaps that, that comes from, again, a lack of historical awareness, that you can't simply rip up the roots and start over. Uh, and in fact, that, 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 uh, you know, um, that opens you up to demagogues who will take power to restore order. Um, and so we, we seem to be in a revolutionary age. Uh, the professor you mentioned at, at a British Columbia University who thinks we should start over from year zero, basically. Um, uh, so identity politics, uh, we're getting away from this notion of being an American or a citizen of France or a Canadian. Um, and instead people are retreating into what I thought Martin Luther King and others almost killed off completely was this tribalism of color. Uh, tribalism of identity. And um, we're, we're back in the soup, are we not? Where people are starting to look at each other, not based on shared humanity. We all uh, bleed red blood. But um, whether your ancestors picked on my ancestors, how did identity politics arise? I mean, what's your understanding as someone who's been in the university environment forever? What led to the rise of identity politics in recent decades? Well, again, I think it has been a process. Um, I think it was well described by the Canadian Stephen Pinker, who is at Harvard, um, and he defined identity politics. He said it's a, it's a syndrome 
um, in which people's beliefs and interests and values are kind of shaped or assumed to be determined by their membership in groups. Again, race, color, religion, these kinds of groups. He says, and I think he's absolutely right, he says that as long as identity politics uh, fights discrimination, it serves a positive purpose. But when it gets beyond that, to the point of saying that, you know, you don't share my identity, you can't represent me, you can't speak for me, you can't even be part of the conversation uh, uh, that I'm part of. That's when it becomes dangerous. By the way, in the United States, uh, others, a guy by the name of Mark Lilla, of Columbia University. He said this had happened. He said that American liberalism, liberals have thrown themselves into the movement politics of identity and they have lost a sense of what it means to be a citizen. Now that's, that's a very severe judgment from a very well-placed observer. He's not the only one, Francis Fukuyama out at Stanford. These are people who have expressed real concerns about the impact of identity politics, um, particularly the severe variant of it, which is you're not one of me, you're not like me. We don't have much to do with one another. That's a very, very severe problem. And it's pointed out uh, now increasingly, I think, by uh, observers. And it's been a process. It starts off with the appropriate and laudable anti-discrimination motives, but it has morphed into a more severe, limited, and frankly, a nastier kind of politics. Well, this connects into your your idea of um, of citizenship. Let me just uh, publicize the book title again, uh, midpoint here. We're talking with Peter McKinnon, author of Canada in Question, exploring our citizenship in the 21st century. So, Peter, um, I, I think th this connects obviously back to your notion of citizenship and your defense and advocacy of citizenship. Um, citizenship, at least in a multi ethnic, multicultural country, has to be based in something that's not connected to your your color, your race, your ethnicity, uh, your religion. Um, it has to be, there has to be an acknowledgement, understanding that we can empathize with each other, despite the, you know, different skin colors, different ancestries and the rest of it. And also that we can unite around an idea. And this to me was the, uh, the beauty, um, the attraction of Western liberalism, at least defined in a classical sense, not liberals today who may be progressives or woke, but I mean the classic Western liberalism that said what matters is the individual, and you can be a citizen of the state, regardless of your skin color, what the British fought for vis-a-vis -vis, uh, much of the world in the 19th century uh, with their abolitionist efforts, uh, what John Diefenbaker, a prime minister, fought for as a lawyer before he became prime minister vis-a-vis -vis Quebec and their narrow definition of citizenship in their case. Um, but again, this notion of shared empathy, shared humanity, that we can empathize with each other, and that we can, we can unite around a laudable idea, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the rule of law, capitalism, whatever it, even on the negative side, in the 20th century, Marxists were asking people to unite around an, ident or an idea, Marxism, but not, um, not identities. They suppressed nationalist movements as a result. Um, but now we're back, I mean, you mentioned First Nations a moment ago. Um, is there not a problem when some some indigenous uh, academics and others uh, and professors that you mentioned and leaders of First Nations uh, almost make the mistake, I would say, that the Europeans have made throughout their history, perhaps as an accident of geography, where, again, they emphasize the differences as opposed to what potentially united them? Um, and that some First Nations leaders in actually advocating for sovereignty of each First Nation, 600 plus First Nations, are making the same mistake as Europeans over the centuries. I mean, it's not realistic to have 600 plus independent sovereign First Nations, plus Canada, plus Quebec, et cetera, et cetera. So do we not deal with some of the same problems here? 
uh, that other countries are dealing with. We're just not as far down the road. But uh, that particular First Nations and leaders in, in specific are ironically imitating the worst of, of European practice over the centuries, which is to divide into ever smaller factions. I think that uh, there are relatively few Indigenous uh, scholars that I would put into that uh, particular camp, but, but they're there and uh, they need to be debated. Um, they need to be kind of confronted in the world of ideas. And the question has to be asked, well, what do you see coming after? Uh, a supposed end of the Canadian state. We don't hear too much discussion about that. And I suspect that the possibilities are deeply, deeply troubling. Mm. I think there was some, you mentioned some of the other core ideas. There was actually some genius in the idea of peace, order, and good government. Peace, order governing ourselves well, it doesn't make reference to uh, uh, any privileged group of people. It doesn't exacerbate differences among different groups of people. Um, it is the kind of appeal that most people should say in a diverse, multinational, multi-regional population and country, resolving differences peacefully in a ordered way and governing ourselves well, these are wonderful. <laughs> these are wonderful ideas, wonderful appeals. Um, but we don't hear, again, too much talk about peace, order, and good government today. It has perhaps receded. Um, we hear it from time to time. But it's, uh, it's actually, a, I think, a very noble idea and a, a good rallying cry for citizens. Let me jump into the part of your book about populism. Uh, there's been a rise in this. Uh, I mean, populism, I've always thought, can be simply defined as democratic sentiment uh, when citizens are frustrated or not even frustrated. Um, you know, what's populism versus a democratic you know, uh, preponderance um, in the population. Um, so talk a little bit about your view of populism, where it's healthy, where it's not healthy, um, where, you see, where you see it popping up these days in Canada. Well, um, I've had a few people say to me, I pretty heard on the populists and uh, wasn't intending to be particularly... Um, Populism, of course, is not really an ideology. There are populists of the left and of the right and of uh, all kinds of positions in between. I think it's a style. Um, it is anger directed at elites. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I'm not saying that it's uh, it's misplaced or largely misplaced, but it is anger directed at, at elites, and it is uh, a very, I think, generally where it's practiced, antagonistic and aggressive style. Uh, it doesn't concede much to those who disagree with the populist expression. In fact, it treats them as a very objectionable other. Um, and so my concern with populism is not so much a set of ideas with a set of ideas that it may or may not be about. It's an acerbic, aggressive, uncompromising style that makes conversation, again, with whom the populists don't agree, Difficult, if not impossible. Is it also a result, though, in Canada of a lack of alternative means or um, regular means of feedback between politicians and the public? And to give you clear examples of what I mean, um, I'm a tremendous supporter. I admire countries that have referendums more regularly than we do um, in states in the U.S., although some of the states can have them, it seems like, every second day. 
But two examples, I mean, the Swiss recently voted on whether to retain a carbon tax, they said, or to have a carbon tax, they said no, but the Swiss have voted on everything in much of their history from immigration to whether to keep the army, to tax rates, to the minimum wage. Uh, to me, um, th this seems to involve Swiss, the Swiss and their politicians in a constant feedback loop, which I actually think is healthy. I mean, behind the scenes, you've met enough politicians, as have I, to know they get frustrated with the population. And behind the scenes, they'll, in some cases, disparage the very voters they're seeking votes from um, because they don't understand the nuances or the challenges of being in power and the compromises that they have to make as politicians. Um, it seems to me referendums are one way to, to bridge that for a politician to say, okay, well, you can take responsibility now by voting in this referendum, whether you really want X and pay extra money for it, extra taxes for it. But to give clear examples, again, the carbon tax, whether you like it or agree with it or disagree with it, to me, that was a, a great example of the Swiss being able to debate an issue and then come to a conclusion. Or in California, uh, this was particularly telling, the most liberal city in the United States, San Francisco, the school board over the course of the pandemic apparently kept kids out for a year at least. Meanwhile, the three school board trustees are trying to rename schools after Abraham Lincoln, because he's not woke enough, obviously, being a 19th century figure, and also Dianne Feinstein, a very liberal U.S. senator from that state. Um, apparently, again, in the most liberal city in the United States, in San Francisco, a group of uh, parents of East Asian ancestry said, this is enough and began a recall campaign and recalled all three school board trustees on the premise that the school board wasn't doing its job, which is to get kids in school, teach them courses, and to not rename schools after Abraham Lincoln and Diane Feinstein. To me, again, there is this feedback mechanism that exists in referendum and recall that for the most part we don't have in Canada. Uh, where legislation exists, it's pretty weak. It, it discourages actually this process. Is that part of the problem? Uh, unlike other countries, I mean, even the European Union has referendums now and then. So is this part of the problem in Canada? Uh, we wait every four years for an election and then third party groups, as they're called, are not allowed to participate in the election to the same degree as political parties. It seems like politicians do everything to discourage the average citizen from actually participating and stamp down on them. And the Emergencies Act was another good example where they froze bank accounts. Um, I, I digress a little bit, but I mean, I was not a fan of shutting down you know, the border. Uh, when truckers did that. Nonetheless, I understood the frustrations, but to freeze bank accounts. So it seems like politicians in Canada do everything they can to tell people to stay away from politics, the political process, to be the anti-Athenians, so to speak. And then they're surprised when there's a reaction in populism. I mean, it's a long way of asking, is populism in Canada partly the result of... Um, elite is an overused word, but the chattering classes who want to keep all the chattering to themselves? Mark, uh, I think problems with our institutions and with confidence in them or a lack of confidence in them is a very large part of this. Um, it's a wonderful book that was written by Donald Savoie. By the way, the problem with our parliament is not what Pierre or Justin Trudeau says it is. The problem is a House of Commons in decline, and it's been in decline for years and years. Um, have a look at the sittings of Parliament just over the last two, three, or four years, and the number of times the Parliament was prorogued, adjourned, overridden, uh, ignored. That's a serious problem. And of course, it has its roots in members of Parliament who know darn well that their successful political careers depend on not offending the prime minister. Mm. And by doing what the prime minister and the prime minister's office, not the Privy Council office, but the prime minister's office, tells them to do. We have a cabinet, and this is Donald Savoy's judgment, who spent his whole life studying the institutions of Canadian government. He says, cabinet's not a cabinet government. It's a focus group for the prime minister. And it's treated like a focus group mm -hmm. for the prime minister. And then, of course, we all know the continuing legitimacy issues with the Senate. When you look at Canadian federal institutions and you see a parliament that is not working well, you see cabinet government that is not, in fact, cabinet government. When you see 
a Senate that continues to suffer from legitimacy issues, then those institutions diminish in importance and nature abhors a vacuum. And it, the vacuum, I think, to some extent is occupied by the more populist uh, discourse that we're hearing more of. Uh, you mentioned Justin Trudeau as prime minister and really a centralization of power, which has been going on at least since his father, since Pierre Trudeau. Um, but let's compare the two individuals, uh, the two prime ministers, uh, on your question of citizenship, though, and, and equality before the law. Am I right in assuming that uh, the father would have disagreed vehemently with his son on the notion of identity politics, uh, the catering to Quebec, frankly? Um, Pierre Trudeau was never silent on Quebec nationalism or the treatment of minorities within Quebec. So Pierre Trudeau versus Justin Trudeau and the question of citizenship, where would Pierre Trudeau have landed on some of the statements that, that, has come out, that came out of his son's mouth in the past several years? I think Pierre Trudeau, why was he in politics? Uh, he was in politics to keep Quebec in Canada. Um, that was his motivation. And, and that was a significant part of his success. He had shortcomings and failings like we all do, but that was a big part of his success. If you go back to his days as editor of the Montreal Cité Libre, it became clear that Pierre Trudeau detested ethnic nationalism of all kinds, wherever it was. I think it was a, a very substantial part of his makeup. And it explains his approach to Quebec within Canada. And I think it would reflect in views that he would hold about identity politics that I suspect would be very, very different from those of Trudeau Jr. Um, I think, too, that Trudeau's greatest contribution to Canadian federalism, and again, people will have different views about this. My views are unbalanced positive, but I think it was the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That was his contribution. That was his very powerful belief. And, um, and again, we, we have the Charter. We'll have differences about its interpretation from time to time. But uh, the Charter of Rights reflected, I think, Trudeau Sr.'s view that you needed some elements of citizenship, including an understanding of rights that we all have in order to hold us together despite our differences. Um, that's Trudeau Sr. I don't profess to know what the core interest and belief about Canada and Canadian citizenship. I don't profess to know what uh, Trudeau Jr.'s views there are there. Uh, what does he really believe? Does he believe our institutions are as corrupt as he has said they are, corrupted by systemic racism, corrupted by colonialism? Does he believe that? Does he really believe that? Does he believe that, in fact, our differences, it is our differences that are most important and not some sense of where those differences might end and where we might be more united? I don't know the answers to those questions because he has never answered those questions, at least to the best of my knowledge. What does Canada really mean, really mean to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau? Let's move on to your observation that universities these days are corrosive to enlightenment values. Uh, can you describe or, or define enlightenment values historically, what that, what that means? and 
why you think universities these days have not been helpful uh, to to uh, what was historically uh, the accomplishments of the Enlightenment and the understanding of the, of the Enlightenment. Well, I don't want to overstate this, <clears throat> um, but I but I do think there is an issue in part because I have seen it, and it lies in a tendency on the part of some in our universities uh, to really denounce and condemn those with whom they disagree. I've seen some of this, by the way. I've seen faculty and students shout down those with whom they disagree. I've seen it. Um, and I don't think universities have been as forceful as they need to be in saying that's not on, that's just not on. Let me interject and ask a question though. Have they been, um, have universities and administrations in universities anywhere in the last 50 years actually taken a tough line in favor of um, freedom of expression, or I mean, when 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 this sort of thing erupts, like I'm thinking back to you know free speech riots of the late 1960s, which were at least were in favor of free speech, but the kind of disruption that's occurred in university campuses since what Berkeley in the late 1960s, have universities anywhere really taken a tough line when there's been a disruption? I, maybe so, but um, are, are you aware of circumstances? Because to me, it seems like most universities cave, or in favor, or, or in fact, these days some university administrations and a lot of the professoriat might well agree with the criticisms of a 20 year old student um, and, and not want debate on campus. Um, but am, am I being too broad and unfair? I would be, um, I'd be careful of overgeneralization. I think we did see, by the way, at Berkeley, we saw some fighting back. We've seen the University of Chicago statement of principles um, and and we, we have we have different experiences to report. I think, Mark, we should be deeply alarmed though by the recent report that came out of the McDonald Laurier Institute um, just a couple of weeks ago, which reported, and by the way, it was a systematic survey of university professors conducted by Leger, which is a very reputable survey firm. And the work was, the background work was done by two professors, one at Trent and one at Concordia. It reported that more than 50% of right-leaning professors, and right-leaning professors are a very small minority in our university, but more than 50% of them would not express their views because of fear mm -hmm. of recrimination from colleagues, students, and others. By the way, more than 30% of left-leaning professors said that they too would be reluctant to express their personal views because of the apprehension of uh, kind of uh, striking back at them for some reason. But what to me was most alarming about this survey is that 30% of those surveyed indicated that they would be prepared to cancel and deny free speech to colleagues with whom they disagreed on social justice issues. I think that is a very, very ominous survey. And it should concern everybody who cares about our universities. What can be done about that is the question. Um, because yes, that, that is concerning. I remember reading Alan Bloom's book, The Closing of the American Mind, uh, shortly after it was published in 1987. I think I read it in the summer of 1988. He had concerns about the universities then, but I don't recall this being a concern of, of his. He was concerned about um, the trajectory towards the notion that only power defines everything uh, and is at the base of everything. 
um, and a, the shredding of, of uh, you know, norms within the university system. Uh, but uh, it, it seems to have declined much more significantly since, since Alan Bloom and the closing of the American mind. Um, so what can be done about this? Because uh, some of this conversation has been going on for 30 or 40 years now. Well, I have always believed that the remedy in the first instance lies with the administration of the university. And we've seen courageous examples of uh, fighting back against some of these behaviors and tendencies. I, th I think every university administration should be held accountable for the openness of culture and the openness to difference and to critique. They should be held accountable for that on their campuses. By the way, all of them pay lip service to it. Of course, we're in favor of free speech. Of course, we're in favor of freedom of expression and of academic freedom and of all of these things. But when you look underneath the surface as the McDonald Laurier survey did, you discover that there are some significant cracks in the edifice. I think university leaders have to be more prepared than they have been to call out instances of silencing and, and denouncing uh, some among their members. And I think they have the, uh, they have the responsibility to assert that the core values of the university and the core functions of the university require debate, discussion, not ritualistic denunciation. Is it possible, though, to reform the universities from within? I mean, we're back to almost the ancient Greece here and the question of who guards the guardians, right? <laughs> a Platonic question. Uh, I mean, who who can who can check um, the guardians in the university, the administration, if they don't grasp that this is a necessary first duty that they should themselves uh, you know, make sure they're 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 tracking? Uh, you know, then we get situations like Mount Royal University and the firing of Francis Francis Whittison. Back to the Enlightenment values which we haven't gotten to quite yet, but will in our last five minutes here. Um, Francis Woodison defines an enlightenment interpretation or definition of knowledge, that there's no such thing as indigenous knowledge anymore. There's any such thing as European knowledge. There's only knowledge. Two plus two equals four, and any individual can, can make that calculation. I'm giving a simplified version of it. But she was fired for, in part, for, for saying this European, uh, this enlightenment concept, rather, um, the definition of knowledge uh, should stand. Um, so is it any surprise that a good chunk of universities in the McDonald Laurier survey, university professors would think, yes, they should probably not speak out on such issues uh, because they may be next up uh, to the, you know, uh, the, the verbal, uh, the rhetorical guillotine, so, so to speak, and university administrations are not defending it. So um, is this more, are we going to go down the road, do you think, where maybe it's more donors that say, look, if you're really going to engage in this sort of nonsense and you're anti-enlightenment um, and you're anti-free expression, um, you can count on us not to contribute in the future and maybe brave governments that say the same thing to universities, many of which are publicly supported. Is that where the remedy is going to be, is pressure from the outside? As much as universities like their independence, if they're not actually defending the historic mission of universities, which to be centers of free inquiry, why shouldn't governments or donors start to be a little more upfront with uh, university administrations and say, we're not funding that? Well, I have no problem with that. I think that, um, you know, we depend upon the university administration first to address these issues. If they prove uh, either incapable or reluctant to do so, then of course there are adverse consequences that will flow from that. But there's another point, Mark, that I just want to make fairly quickly. There's a very common expression in our universities and outside them too about different ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. There are different ways of knowing. There's your way of knowing. There's my way of knowing. There are different ways of knowing particular to people of different race, culture, color, all of these things, religion. Think about the implications of that. <laughs> 
Mm. If you have your way of knowing and I have my way of knowing and we know different things, there's nothing much for us to talk about. You have your truth, I have mine. And we hunker down behind our respective truths and don't meet in the common forum, whether it's of the university, of the city, or of the country. So in addition to a denial of um, the possibility for shared empathy between people just because they happen to have different skin colors or what have you, or different experiences, um, people are making the mistake, perhaps, it sounds like you're saying, of denying the possibility of shared knowledge, right? And it's moral relativism run amok or something, uh, some relativism run amok. Uh, if, we, if we can't agree that there's uh, a scientific method and a way to find out what, what knowledge you know, can actually be discovered by all of us, um, then yeah, we're in a pretty pickle, right? Uh, I mean, the, in the physical world, to be claiming that your your truth is applied to how to construct this building is different than my truth, and you better hope you you hire the right structural engineer <laughs> to actually believe that, right? So, um, but we we've seen this in the humanities. So, uh, in our closing minute or two here, Peter, do you um, are there are there seeds of optimism you can plant here? Um, do you, do you see? Uh, change on the horizon? Like, has anything recently given you hope after you wrote this book, Canada in Question, that uh, perhaps there is a, a hunger now for, again, shared humanity, the possibility of shared ideas, shared citizenship? I'm not sure that there is. I think there are some uh, encouraging possibilities. I think they begin with reform of our institutions, by the way, of Parliament, of Cabinet, of the Senate but particularly of uh, parliament and cabinet the issues are very, very serious there. I think too, that we need to address the great East-West divide uh, and uh, how that is to be done, I, I don't know, but I think a really good approach is the Australian approach to equalization, which is to take it out of the hands of the politicians and put it in the hands of a professional group of people who understand the, uh, the economics of different federal states, you know, basically a government can do with equalization what it wants to do in Canada. It cannot do so in Australia. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to start with those kind of issues of reform, which I, none, of, none of the issues seem to me to be intractable. We can address these issues. Uh, we can address the regional divide. We can address the importance of respecting the constitutional division of powers, all of these things. Um, and I hope, I hope that we do so soon. Okay, thank you, Peter. I've been talking with Peter McKinnon, author of Canada in Question, Exploring Our Citizenship in the 21st Century, published by the University of Toronto Press. Available at all fine bookstores, at all bookstores, and online, of course, from the usual uh, online sources. Thank you, Peter, for this. I'm Mark Milkey, uh, Executive Director of the Aristotle Foundation for Public Policy. This is part of our series of interviews with a contrarian. I'm not sure, Peter, if you describe yourself as a contrarian or not, uh, maybe <laughs> these days. Um, but uh, thank you. Any last thoughts? Well, I want to thank you and your listeners for uh, your attention. Um, I think that uh, the interview has covered the ground. Thank you, Peter. And viewers can check out aristotlefoundation.org uh, for more on the Aristotle Foundation for Public Policy.